Thank you very much for welcoming us to be part of this event. CAID is such an amazing organization. This is an amazing week. Um, I'm personally really honored to be able to be part of it. My name is Sarah Larson, and I'm the Outreach and Development Director at the Somali Museum of Minnesota, which we're proud to say is, as far as we know, the only museum devoted to preserving Somali culture and heritage currently operating anywhere in the world. But part of the reason we're here is to find out maybe there's something else that we don't know of. So get in touch with us. Um, but Adair Asman Ali will be able to speak so much more about that. Um, so I'm pretty delighted and honored to be moderating this panel of three really powerful, inspiring voices. So Asman Ali, the founder of the Somali Museum, Abira Hussein, an archivist and innovator at the intersections of technology and community cultural preservation, and Jenny Altshuler, who's a clinical psychologist who works in communities experiencing migration. Um, and the theme of this panel is archiving cultural preservation and health, and the ways that community-based preservation and telling of stories and building of identity is really crucial, not only to collective resilience and strength, but really is at the heart of the broader picture of community building and building community health in general. Um, I know for myself as a American woman of European immigration descent, part of my experience growing up was kind of an experience of erasure of the past, of where we came from. You know, I only learned really as an adult that, you know, the places my grandparents came from were these places in Poland and in Russia, and they used to speak languages that I'd never heard. Um, and part of the consequence of that is this sense of mainstream culture, as it were, being also synonymous with white culture, at least in the United States, and that arc of the erasure of stories of people's identities of that process really does so much harm and so much damage to individuals on the level of trying to find yourself and find who you who are and where you exist in the world, um, and on the community level as we're all collectively navigating what is the world that we want to build together. Um, so I think that the work of all three of these amazing panelists is very inspiring and very positive in showing us maybe a path forward to build resilience together and build a better future. So my boss, Arsman, is going to begin. Um, thrilled to be able to introduce this fellow who uh, picked me up off the street about five years ago. <laughs> Um, he is the founder and executive director of the Somali Museum of Minnesota, um, kind of a lifelong entrepreneur and now elder and community leader. Asman started the first Somali driving school in Minnesota. He started the first food delivery business. He has all of these firsts that he can list off for you and can probably tell you more about. Um, but the museum was founded out of this impulse to create a space, especially for Somali youth in Minnesota growing up wanting to access their own culture. And he'll be able to tell you much more about that. So thank you, Asma. Thank you, Sarah. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. OK. Uh, I want to share with you tonight what we have back home. What I'm saying back home is not Somalia, but it's in the United States of America. <laughs> And the real back home is Somalia, actually. But before we speak about what we have there, I would like to share with you why the immigration took place all around the world. The Somalis, you know, spread in all around the world. And the majority of these immigrants lives in the United States and UK. And Minnesota has the largest Somali immigrant in the United States. So we thought about what's going to happen next to this young generation and families who came and settled there. Then UK has the biggest number, I think, than the United States, than Minnesota. So I would like to 
highlight this point and you guys think about what's gonna happen next to this generation who is born and raised here. Before we start anything, I would like you to share with me and watch a few clips from the Somali Museum of Minnesota, what we do and what we are willing to do next. who born and raised here in the United States as well as the other Americans who is living beside these Somali communities and to build a bridge that connects the youth and the families with the other neighborhoods in order to create a good environment for that neighborhood and to learn from each other. so far in the whole world. In Somalia, we don't have any museum right now because all the new things that we had in that museums has been destroyed, stolen, or in ash. I create this museum to preserve something for the youth that gonna ask tomorrow about their heritage and to preserve something for the future. gallery on October 2013. We have over 700 collections that we collected from all around the world. Because of lack of space, we didn't display everything we have here in Minnesota. We need your help to get this happen and we get a big space that we can display all the artifacts and we can build the traditional hat and we can get enough rooms to educate the people. Because of limited time, we couldn't able to continue. But what I like you to see from here, and now we have a population of 100,000 plus in Minnesota of Somali immigrants living there. And I was living in diaspora for a long, long time since I was a kid. But the one who always living outside the country, <clears throat> he loves his culture more than anyone who came, you know, from Somalia or whatever. And I was trying to learn something from my culture and heritage. And I was trying my best to do whatever takes me to learn more about my people and my, you know, heritage and where I came from and how my ancestors were living. It was my first time to travel to Somalia. Actually, I was living in Arabian countries. And I was living a couple of years in America, 20 years maybe. And it was my first time to travel to Somalia in 2009. 2009, I went there just to learn something from the Somalis, from the culture, what's going on there. But when I went there, 
I found the young generation who lives in Somalia, they know nothing about their heritage and culture. I asked five of them from the age of 20 to 25th, I would, I would like to take with me Sibrar and take it to, Soma, to America. How can I get Sibrar? I think none of the young guys living, sitting here knows what Sibrar is. But I asked those who live back home. They said, oh, we know this. We know Sibrar, but actually we don't. They used to put something in it. They used to put something in that Sibrar. But actually, we forget the name. Most of them, the, f the five of them, they couldn't able to get what Sibrar is used for. Then I thought about if this who living here is in this situation, what about those who living in America? How we can protect this unique culture and heritage not to be lost? And I scared about the artifacts that our nomads were making it. It might be eliminated from the whole country one day. Because when I went there, I found that instead of using Dishi, Hanti, Hadubgalki, Ulaigi La Marina, Arthurti La Marina, La Asla, they are using cherry can, plastic stuff and something which is not healthy. Instead of using the organic stuff that we were used, we were used, used it. So I start to collect the stuff. And I started from the Sebrar, actually. The Sebrar took me forever to get it, because everyone is using cherry can, plastic thing. Then I collect like seven items that time. I came with seven, including the Sebrar. I couldn't able to find the Sebrar in the location that I was that time. But finally, some people told me in Hargeisa, they said, you can't find the Sebrar in Boreme. Then I called someone in Boreme, and he said, only the herders comes with the Sebrar you know, they bring the milk with the sibrar, so how we can ask them to get this? I said, please, tell them I will pay you as much as you can, but buy the sibrar with the milk. Take the milk and send the sibrar to me. Then they did the same thing. They sent the sibrar to me, and the sibrar now is in the museum. We sanitize it, we clean it, and it's from the museum. I scared about the young generation who born and raised here in the United States or anywhere else in the, you know, other countries. One day they might lose everything they had in back home. They might, know, they might not know anything about their heritage and culture. So I started the museum to educate this young generation with their culture and heritage and educate the other communities beside that just to know more about the Somali culture. The non-Somalis always, we try our best to build a bridge that connects the Somali community with other communities to learn from each other. Once they learn from each other and we spread the word and tell them how, what our culture is and heritage and how our ancestors were living, back of the days, and how's our, you know, passionate culture. They want to know a lot about us. We tell them what's our culture exactly, what we do. If we see this and this, it's not something bad that we are doing, but it's our culture and habit. Don't take it serious. And they want to learn from us also. So beside the tour that we have and the artifacts we collected in the museum, more than 700 collection. 
And we, I brought this year even, three months ago, one container, two more Agal Somali, and more than 100 artifacts from the south side of Somalia. Because what I have before was from the central of Somalia and north Somalia. And we are trying to build this institution and make it happen. And all communities take advantage of it. The programs that we are running, as you saw here, is traditional dance from all around the states of Somalia. I hired two guys, one from the south side, one from the north, to teach these kids how to dance. Instead of staying in the streets or you know, going somewhere that may do something illegal or wrong, they come all to the museum. They learn traditional dance. They do their homeworks there. They learn more about the artifacts. They listen about those who give you know, the, the tour. So it's not only tour, but we have traditional dance classes, weaving classes, we have mobile show, you know, um, brand stations. We have Somali language. We do a lot. And it goes through from kindergarten, elementary, middle school, high school, college, universities. We are in every spot that people call us for. And in Minnesota, the museum became an institution that everybody asks about it, and they need more information always. So we send always to all schools, you know, government sectors. We send to, you know, whenever they ask for class, we send someone who gives that class. And one day you're going to see a dance troupe in different location, mobile show in another location, weaving classes in another location. In one day, we are performing three different classes, and that goes every day. If we don't do one day, every other day we have a couple different classes. Yeah. Uh, so that's how we are doing this, and just to save our kids from the situation that we are, and we are facing everybody to keep that and hold your culture, religion, and language. And always, we advise with the families that we come to us to teach their kids the Somali language while they are home. If you don't teach your kids your, the language while they are home, they won't help you tomorrow. Everybody has to be you know, familiar with that. So please try to help this community and save the young generation and let them learn the Somali language, their culture and religion. These three is connected. If you lose your language, you're going to lose your culture. If you lose your culture, the religion, I don't know how it's going to be. So thank you so much. And that's it. Mm. Thank you so much, Adair Osman. I am, um, and we're going to have more time to ask questions later. But first, we're going to have Abira also present her presentation. I think she has something that the tech team can pull up. <laughs> Abira Hussein is an archivist and a scientist, and we had the pleasure of getting to connect earlier today and hear more of her work. Um, she is currently a Transforming Archives trainee under the National Archive in collaboration with the London Metropolitan Archives. She's also currently undertaking a research residency with the British Library, exploring their digitized collections. On top of that, she's currently completing an MR in clinical research at Imperial College. She's working on Healing Through Archives, a Somali digital archive project that explores heritage, migration, and health. And her work explores how inequalities in access lead to poor outcomes for refugee and migrant communities. She's also created several cool 
gadgets. I don't know if that's the term that you would use for yourself, <laughs> but I know she has a project over there on the table um, that hopefully she'll get to tell us about, as well as she's done quite a bit of work with 3D printing and replication of Somali cultural artifacts to make them accessible to the public. So really excited to hear from Abira. Hello. Uh, I'm not an archivist yet, I should say, <laughs> training, and I just finished my master, so I'm glad that's over. Um, so actually, I just really wanted to thank Osman um, for what he said, because I think it's, maybe we don't, I don't know if everyone fully appreciates the level of what he has done and what he has achieved, um, and I think working in the heritage sector, I've come to realise how important it is to have agency and to be able to have institutions that are run by ourselves. Um, what he's able to do is to, A, to educate Somalis, but also to employ Somalis to uh, learn the culture. And also, I think he has a um, acute understanding of the importance of displaying Somali culture and in a way that's more authentic, um, with particularly the Somali troupe and the mobile shows. Um, sometimes museums, I think, are a strange place, um, very kind of cold and dislocated from the community that they hold objects from, but actually what he's doing is, uh, you know, bringing that heritage to life. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I, well, I work in an archive, um, and I don't know how many people know an archive or have visited an archive. Um, we hold documents, mainly 2D, uh, papers, photographs, uh, and sound um, and visual uh, heritage. Um, I can't stress the importance of archives. Um, I guess it's the primary. Uh, I guess it's often used as uh, a primary source for history, um, and it's also something that I should emphasise. Uh, it's not a neutral process. What you collect, how you choose to collect, how you choose to uh, share that, uh, is a choice. It's very subjective, um, and it's chosen by an individual who will often um, decide what they consider to be important. And as you can realise, uh, there's a current theme with this kind of thing, and there's a hierarchy in what's um, considered important. And for me, my project, I guess, is trying to understand the reasons why we come here and why we came here, um, and using archives as a way of um, showing that journey, um, but also trying to increase um, representation. Um, and so I guess today, because I prefer visuals than lots of words, uh, I've just collected some, downloaded some images from archives that kind of show part of the history of um, how we came here. So as some of you know, we're based in East London, um, and this is, I guess, one of the first locations where Somalis arrived as seamen. Um, can I have the next slide? <laughs> so, so yeah, these are, this is an image of uh, the Crown and Realm, um, and it shows, um, I guess, the initial documentation of how British East and Central Africa were uh, annexed uh, and colonised, um, and so it talks about how it was established in 1884. Um, and so you can see from this document here, um, you know, I guess the initial interactions with Britain. Uh, can I have the next slide? Sorry. Um, and here it talks about um, the climate being very hot and dusty um, and not. Uh, often, when you look at the archives um, that relate to Somalia, um, they speak very strangely of the community of being very, I'm sorry, being very independent and uh, unruly um, and not easy to manage. Um, and so this, I guess, talks about um, how Britain or how Somalia was um, separated uh, and segmented. Um, and I think I wanted to kind of emphasize that uh, our migration and our story here has been a long one. Um, it started in the second half of the 19th century, um, so almost 150 years old, um, as well as um, trying to recognize, and I guess we talk about culture and the importance of culture, but I think um, it's difficult to, um, I guess, emphasize that when those who came recently in the 1980s kind of, and I guess most of my work is trying to understand how we foster the sense of belonging and how we get people to connect to their culture. 
and there is a, I guess, as Sarah mentioned, there is an erasure that exists in institutions, um, and I guess this was trying to highlight where you can start to find your own history um, and try to connect back to the Somalis um, that arrived here. Uh, can I have the next slide? And so this is, and part of recognizing Somali migration um, as seamen, this is an image, and you can find a lot of information about Somalis that um, arrived here. Um, because they were seafarers, they arrived and settled in port cities. So this is an example, and just, you can, I'm not sure you can see uh, Somali on there, but it mentions um, vessels with, uh, Somalis working on board. And most of the Somalis that were seamen were firemen and trimmers. So that is they worked in the bottom part of the ship, in the hottest part. And the reason that, that they were placed there or made to work there was because they thought that because they came from a hot climate, they would be able to handle working in, that, in those conditions. And it was incredibly harsh uh, conditions. Um, and so, can I just have the next slide? You can just um, have it playing, it's fine, easier. Um, and so these are just different documentations and mentionings of Somalis um, who are seamen um, in Hull, in Belfast, um, and the Port of London, and it goes all the way up to the uh, early 1900s. Um, Somalis, their interactions in here has been very long. Um, and I guess part of archives is that actually it can show and represent our history. And I guess some of the issues that I found working in an archive, that actually that's something quite difficult to get. Um, you know, this is October. The reason why we're here is because it's Black History Month. Um, and recognizing that um, sometimes the history is pigeonholed to a particular time. Um, and I think for us, having a sense of belonging, having the agency to be able to actually create our own projects is quite difficult. Um, and because I think often when you're, when you're at school, um, the history that you learn is very much about, you know, the Civil War, uh, sorry, not Civil War, uh, Civil Rights Movement in America, Martin Luther King, um, and there isn't much about actually black British history and even less about Somali history. Uh, we're, in a, we're a unique community, you know, we both, we face both Islamophobia as well as racism, um, but that isn't recognized. And even amongst black history, there is a particular black history that is told, um, either relates to the African Caribbean community or the West African community. And you rarely find stories about Somalis, even though we were one of the first black communities to settle in the UK. Um, and so those are some of the issues that I face trying to actually do work about Somalis. Uh, as I said, archiving is not neutral. Um, and it's so important that actually it is representative, like the National Archives, uh, the local authority archives, they have a public, um, I guess, um, responsibility to be representative, um, but they're not. Um, and this happens in either A, not choosing to collect uh, archives that are, that are reflective of us, or um, when they do collect it, it's not catalogued, and so therefore the public can't search for it. So you may be searching for something that relates to your history and you get no results, and you're told you're, you don't exist, um, and your history doesn't exist, but actually it's not catalogued. And when it is catalogued, you have poor descriptions. So it's, most of these images come from the welcome. Uh, some of the black, uh, images of black women are just described as African women. Um, so we're homogenized, um, and there isn't any, the complexities of our culture um, and our stories is not demonstrated um, because in the end, I think most of these people don't see us as human. Um, and I know that's quite a harsh thing to say, but I think we've had many iterations of um, attempts to find equality. Recently, Theresa May uh, released the Race Disparity Report, and they spoke about mental health within the black community, uh, particularly for men being poor, but actually for women getting worse and worse. And I speak about inequality because actually, um, I think um, this links to inequality, whether it's inequality in housing, inequality in the funded resources, inequality in the lack of representation that we have in the museum sector, inequality in the lack of job opportunities that black people can have. Um, because if we're not present in uh, the decision making, then we're not going to be present in the outcome. Um, and so part of these archives are valuable because in the end, these are the primary sources that historians use to tell stories, and then the narrative develops from there. So, um, 
part of that, and I mentioned inequality of making sure then that our heritage actually is digitized. So we have <coughs> records that show Somalis as seamen, show them uh, here in these archives, show them as seamen, as well as fighting in the First and Second World War. Um, one of the documentations that I have in this presentation talks about rations during the Second World War, and um, there was a disparity in the rations that you would receive, depending on your ethnicity. If you were white, you would get more food. If you were black, you would get less. Um, and so this is, and often when we think about British, uh, what's being British, people talk about fighting in the war, what actually many of us, uh, many of us that were Somali did. Um, and even then, they weren't really recognized. Um, and so archives are important because actually uh, everything is always documented. You will always find some documentation, whether that's human rights violations that have happened. Um, and so, and I think documentation is important. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think I was just trying to show here the type of records that you can find uh, in the Welcome Library, that you can find in the British Library, uh, archives you can find in um, the British <coughs> Museum. These all document and show uh, our stories um, and also oral histories. But I guess it's knowing where to look because um, often sometimes these, this knowledge is very much... Um, so as well as actually... Because um, if you look at some of the archives that exist in uh, uh, institutions, they're quite problematic. Uh, archives from Sir Hans Sloan or Henry Welcome, which is based in Euston, um, show images of women, uh, naked women, um, objectified, um, exoticized. Um, and so you look at that and you think, well, if this is the representation that, that exists in institutions, what story does it tell about me? Um, and how do people actually uh, know who I am and know my culture? Um, and so the Welcome Now are currently looking to actively collect. And I guess when there is a lack of representation, the initiative here was to actually uh, actively collect images to provide a counter narrative to some of the problematic um, history that exists in institutions. Um, and I guess the purpose of this in the end is that there is a lot of evidence that says a sense of belonging and identity affects your well being, and that social isolation doesn't mean living alone, but it can also be culturally as well. Um, and so these are some images that I collected uh, at Autograph um, as part of the Missing Chapter project, which was looking to challenge, um, I guess, the story of black migration and that it only happened during the Windrush, which is in the 1960s, um, but actually that we've always been here. Thank you, Abira. So last on the panel, and then we'll be able to ask some questions. And I'm really excited for the conversation that emerges between these three folks, um, is Dr. Jenny Altschuler. And Dr. Altschuler is a clinical psychologist and family psychotherapist with experience of working with families facing life-threatening illness and migrants in the UK and elsewhere, including in Kosovo and in Northern Greece. Um, for much of her professional life, Jenny worked for the NHS, including the Royal Free Hospital and Tavistock Clinic and is now working as an independent psychotherapist, supervisor, and trainer for the One-to-One -one Children's Trust and Refugee Trauma Initiative. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, thank you. Um, well, before starting, what really struck me, particularly with Abira speaking about archives and your speaking about archives, that um, a really important part of um, my role as a, as a therapist is something about creating a context in which people can share their thoughts, their feelings, um, and really listening and bearing witness to the kind of suffering people are experiencing. But another really important part of it is asking questions, m raising comments that open up the possibility of other ways of thinking about it. Because whatever stories we tell about our lives, if we'd all seen a traffic accident, we'd come up with different, different stories we'd tell about it afterwards. So therein lies the possibility of change, which is if we've landed up creating a story for ourselves that is one that's very uncomfortable for ourselves, for our families, um, there's always the possibility that by unpicking it a little bit more, you might land up seeing things that you haven't thought about before, including even in situations that are horrendous, something about what's helped you to 
what's carried you through, what in the past has carried you through. And I was just thinking, it's the idea of archives and multiple stories and evolving stories is so much part of the migration experience. Um, and I'm speaking here also from a personal perspective in that I come from a family where there's been a migration virtually every generation and I grew up in apartheid-based South Africa. You may pick up from the accent, been here for about 40 years and there was a time when my kids were living in the States and I had that feeling of like, oh, you know, where they're gonna stay, where's gonna be their sense of belonging. Um, maybe if you take, Jay, if you take it on to the next. Oh. Oh, yeah. Um, Edward Said spoke about exile as the unhealable rift between the self and the true home, whereby the achievements of exile are permanently undermined by the loss of something left behind forever. And I guess even if experiences are, of migration are fairly uncomplicated, it always involves some sort of disruption between our past, our present, an imagined future. In some cases, and may, you know, I don't know what's true of your own families, but in some cases, people seem to have been able to negotiate the changes without too much difficulty. In some cases, it's just created um, a new opportunity and a chance to get away from a difficult, um, a, you know, really uncomfortable political system, sometimes from very uncomfortable family relationships, um, and creating a, a chance, for example, of becoming a much more independent person than might have been possible in one's family, or any, anything else. You know, it's something of the order of being a positive opportunity, um, professional, educational opportunities. But of course, for many people, it's, some, it's, a fa it's an experience of loss and multiple loss. And not only the loss of moving and saying goodbye to one's families or not even having time to say goodbye to one's families, but about the losses and the multiple hurts that people experience in this country. Um, you know, you've talked about racism, um, about educational opportunities, about access to health, whether or not one really knows how to negotiate the system. So it can be a very, very hostile place one moves to. Um, oh, sorry, Jay, if you just think. Um, and maybe if we'll go on to the next. Um, these are just some images of um, uh, some drawings by a little girl um, in the refugee camps of northern Greece. And in their case, it was about a crossing over the waters um, if you take it on. Thanks, Jet. Yeah. Um, and, and of the children's memories of being of people drowning. Um, and there is something about drawing, um, creating, being a, a way of children making sense of their experience, a way of depicting what they're, what they're seeing. And thinking about families here in the UK, um, Sometimes kids have, the, the experience has been, for them, they've been fairly protected by the whole process. But children can often um, get caught up with what's called post memories, which is in a way they're left holding on to the memories, um, their memories of their parents that they've never been told about, but at some level they can sense it in, a, um, uh, you know, in an unconscious way. Um, so that even if kids didn't go through traumatic experiences, sometimes, sometimes that, that generation are able to get on with life because they've got to survive, they've got to find a way of um, feeding their children, and it's the next generation who are left holding on to some of the, the, the feelings that are so distressing. Um, just staying with loss for a moment, I'm just gonna speak rather than the, um, using the PowerPoint because I think it's easier. Um, in some cases, um, families are living with a strong sense of family members who present, but not, but emotionally absent. Say when parents are just too depressed to really interact with their kids, um, too depressed, feel too, too low in self-esteem to really go out and speak to the teacher and do whatever's, whatever they might otherwise have done. And likewise, there'll be many families whose lives here are very much organized around the imagined views of family members who based elsewhere. 
And it's interesting in terms of the literature and research on migration, by far the majority of the work has been done by people um, who are themselves <coughs> immigrants. Something that there's a, a great emphasis on the, um, uh, the struggles, the heroism of getting on and achieving life, making a life in a new, a new country. There's far less attention paid to the people who are left behind, non-migrants, who've got to find a way of making sense of their lives, even though key members of their families aren't there. Uh, so in many ways, although they haven't moved country, they're living a their lives are very different. In a sense, they're in a very different country in an emotional sense. Um, I mean, in raising these issues, I'm, I'm very aware that um, for, many, for many families, it's been um, about reclaiming strength. There's an enormous amount in terms of resilience. You know, we know, for example, that what helps kids to be more resilient is faced with really difficult circumstances, whether it's a traumatic migration, whether it's illness, whether it's divorce, is access to somebody who you can trust somebody who can help you make sense of your experience, some opportunities for agency, which is what you were talking about, you know, an opportunity to, to feel good about yourself, There's some opportunities um, for self-esteem, as well as something about the regularity of life. But many of the many families who move um, do face a complex um, challenge in terms of establishing a sense of belonging and a sense of belonging, you know, how do I establish a sense of belonging, which is both about being here and there? How do you make those connections? And I think likewise, and maintain those connections, and likewise within families, um, what, as parents, and I'm now a grandparent too, but inevitably, we're, we grow up in contexts that are very different to our parents because of time frame. But for second generation children, they'll be growing up in a, in a place where the context is very different um, as well because of the, it's a totally different cultural um, context, maybe very different language groups. And I suppose one of the challenges as parents is, and as families, is how do you negotiate the whole process whereby kids have got connections to more than one language group, and also to more than one cultural group. And you were talking about the importance of holding on to culture. The tricky thing is kids are also being exposed to a very different culture outside of home. And how much can that be embraced by families? Not that it's about losing one's culture, but so that kids aren't in a position of needing to do things secretly, um, secretly on the side. Um, um, I, I think one of the other challenges that may or may not be relevant to your experiences or to the experiences of other people that you're aware of is also those gendered shifts that um, families will come here again being exposed to a very different situation so that the roles of men and women are very different partly because um, some men might be left beh behind but partly because of the kinds of patterns people are exposed to. Um, and maybe just one last thing, just to say something about some of the particular challenges around illness, is that obviously it means that if you find yourself ill in a new country, um, you may be treated by somebody whose ideas about health and illness and pain is very different to your own. You may be struggling around issues of language differences, but also you may not be able to draw on family support in the way in which you might have done had you, had, had you as a family stayed together. Um, so so maybe, maybe what's, I guess what, in drawing attention to some of the challenges, um, I'm doing so because I think when things are tough, you can feel as though it's about personal failure. It's what I'm not getting right, it's what my parents aren't getting right. And in fact, it's not, in a sense, it's not to do with oneself personally. It's something to do with the context. It's about, it's about actually inhabiting an environment that is much more challenging. So that, um, you know, as, as strong as you are, these are complicated challenges for anyone to be, de to be dealing with. So maybe I'll just leave it at that.
Yeah, thank you to all three of you for your remarks. And I'd love to open the air for questions and I hope that um, maybe all of us up here can also treat this like a conversation. So please respond to each other and throw questions back out at the room. Um, I guess I, I want to start by naming kind of as Abira referred to, there's so many different places where history and stories are archived that aren't part of kind of what's regarded as the mainstream. You know, you might go to a library or a museum in search of history, but we talked quite a bit earlier today about how those are also, they're Western institutions, they're not the only places where history and stories live. In some ways, the way it's structured means that sometimes you have to know what you're looking for. You can't search for it like you would Google. Um, you have to have some prior knowledge, a date, a place, um, a person. Um, and so with archives, I guess the, the archives are not specialists of the collections. Their job is to catalogue and make it available publicly. Um, unlike curators that you find in museums who specialise in a particular area of uh, I guess a, a particular area in the world and specialise in those objects, you won't find that with archivists. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's it's good to have a relationship with your archive um, and to first actually just be a member um, and have a look. Um, the thing I always start with is just searching for Somali and that's it. Um, and sometimes that's helpful, uh, sometimes that isn't. A lot of the records I found of Somali seamen were actually in the county medical officer uh, of health reports. So you wouldn't necessarily think that you'd find anything about Somalis, but because they were looking at port health um, and they would look at the health of seamen, you can find references of Somalis. Um, but I think with museums uh, and how you find the culture, sometimes I think, as I mentioned, museums are a strange place. The way they display culture in glass cases, I don't think is very authentic to our culture, particularly having a strong oral tradition, particularly a lot of the museum objects actually are things that we have at home that we use every day. And I think actually um, we are living our heritage and it's recognizing that actually in the songs that we sing, in the items that we have in our home, uh, in the cloth that we wear, um, that heritage is part of how we live. Um, and so sometimes we don't have to actually look at institutions but actually look at home and to our families and the, our albums um, and the, the things that we actually collect at home. So, yeah. I loved, we saw, I think, um, two nights ago, Edo Jawahir Ali Farah was here and she's done a project collecting both children's games and children's lullabies. And also, you know, all of those things that what, are, what do you do in your daily life that also is a way of passing down culture. Um, I wonder if one of the volunteers could help so we can take some questions. I think the, the, the work that you are doing in Minnesota is absolutely amazing and unique in a way of uh, what happened for the last 30, 40 years in Somali culture and Somali heritage. Uh, but luckily something starting now in uh, Somaliland, in Hargisa, there's a Sarian Museum, just opened it, I think, a few, a uh, couple of months ago, so it's good starting. Uh, and what I know is that a huge uh, collection, whether they are uh, artifacts or uh, cassettes or, or registry, in the hands of uh, uh, private people. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So I think right. we have to, uh, it's really good to have you here today and this can be a sort of a appeal to all those who have this material in their homes if they can share and, 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 and maybe to the museum but also let people know where the material are because if we just know where we have this material it's the starting point that we know that is in somewhere. So uh, that's uh, about, uh, just right. for information, that there's uh, some other places that's coming up now, and it's uh, really uh, good news. The other thing is that what Abir was saying is really fundamental. If we put the material in the museum, we are just uh, letting them die, if you want. Uh, we are closing and putting there, and, and we are preserving for the history, and that's a good thing. But what will be good, if it's possible, like the traditional games, like to put them alive again, if it's possible. So that's also, I agree with, completely agree with that, I that we have to try when it's possible, if we can put uh, again in circulation in the, in the real life. What you are doing, traveling and going outside from the museums is something 
uh, admirable and, and, and absolutely, absolutely great. The last thing that I would like to say is uh, to Usman, we shouldn't be scared if we are losing Sibrair. The world of Sibrair is disappearing. Because of uh, the young people who are in Somaliland or in the Minnesota or in here in London, the fact that they don't use Sibrair and the material is not uh, in, is sort of useful at the moment. Uh, it's like, I consider it's like, uh, like a human being. You have a time that someone will have to pass away. So we put the, in the history, we preserve that they existed in some way, yeah. but we, do, we shouldn't be scared the fact that young people in Hargeisa or in London do not know what does mean Siprar, because they use something else. They have another life, they have another, another way of uh, dealing with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the day by day life. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to preserve for the history, but we shouldn't be punishing the young people to say that you don't know what does mean Sibra? So you lost your heritage. Their culture, their heritage is, is Facebook, uh, is uh, Twitter. They have to know that thing. Uh, they don't. They shouldn't know what does mean Sibra if they are not studying the history or artifacts or something like that. So it's good to have the work we are doing. Extremely important. I, in some way, uh, involved in similar things to collect material in Hargeisa, the Hargeisa Cultural Center. But when young people come and they don't know at all and what the different types of house in Somali, the uh, traditional heart, uh, I'm not uh, killing myself saying that you don't need to know. So that's something mm -hmm. that I want to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What I have seen there is something that surprised me actually. I have to punish them for the reason they didn't know that. You know why? The place that I ask it for the Sivrar is Hingalol. And you know Hingalol is, the, is a place that all those who live there, they are herders, they live with their animals. Around the city of Hingalol, a thousands of sheep and goat and camel and all that. The one who lives in Hingalol, he should have to know what Sivrar is. That's that's my, you know, opinion. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> he was not living in Hargeisa or Mugdushu, but he was living in Hengalol. The one who lives in Ergava, he has to know what's his brother. I have to admit, I don't even know what that I, is. But. I like this. <laughs> I like it that because if they tell me the answer that day, I won't make this museum today. Yeah, good thing they didn't But know. <laughs> I took advantage of them for that reason. Yeah. Trying to capture one aspect of the past um, and not having the ability to actually, some of us may not even be interested in heritage. Uh, some of us may want to do other pieces um, or not even be interested in black history at all. Um, and so we're pigeonholed to kind of look at that. Um, I think the importance of it, though, is when you don't have anything, um, is what the lack of representation can do to people and, and to their self-esteem and to their well-being. Um, and, and so in that way, I, th I see the importance of it. But um, do you mind telling us what Sabra is? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> By the way, Sarah, she speaks Somali. Be careful. <laughs> and I'll tell you another story. When I came Monday, somebody picked me up from the airport. Mustafa, right? Mm -hmm. Mustafa asked me a question. He said, what's the first collection you get for the museum the first time, mm -hmm. your first collection. I said, seven items. He said, what was that seven items? I said, Labardi Yulot, <laughs> and Kor, Sibrar. So he do understand the first three, then he said, what's Sibrar? <laughs> What's going on with Sivrar? <laughs> I thought he's, you know, at, at least he's grown up, he 
can speak good Somali. He was speaking good. He, lo he knows a lot. And I told him, where you came from? He said, from Somalia. What part of Somalia? He said, Burra. I said, Burra, and you don't know Sibrar? <laughs> <laughs> the, the word Sibrar still is, you know, it took my attention back to 2009 when he asked me what Sibrar. Mm -hmm. So it's happening always, but Sibrar is a good example for me, even in the United Kingdom. The first guy who picked me up from the airport, he said, what's the brar? Yeah, like in my Hawaii. But, but well, what is it, though? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't know. <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK. I'm going to select two oh, young <laughs> guys to tell me what's the brar. I know some of you know. <laughs> Okay. You, yeah. raising your hand now. No, you, you. In the front. No, you. What's the prayer? Um, I think it's the thing that you put Made of what? Made of clay. Wood? Clay. No, she knows. Clay? Clay. Yeah, that. Come with us. Who else? You. <laughs> in the front, in the front. Where? Okay. Go ahead. Animal what? Animal hide. Great. You're right. It's a container made of animal skin. Mostly they make it from the goat, sheep, whatever. But they use it for, you know, to carry the milk with them, the herders, especially when they are, you know, with their camel. Mm -hmm. So that's how they carry with them. Hmm. I think we have that question uh, there. Thank you very much. Uh, power relations is that they are rela uh, related to the archives. You see, access to archives is not free. No. Mm -hmm. It has uh, to do with... Yeah. Yeah. It is very asymmetric, um, often, I guess, with the institution. Um, well, so, like I said, it, as I said, archiving is not neutral. The first process is often, um, well, A, it's what they choose to collect. Um, so if they're interested in your heritage or they're in, if they think that your collection is significant, and as I say, significant is a subjective term, um, they will choose to pursue that. Um, for instance, where I was working, um, we collect public records from public places, um, from private collectors, um, from businesses. Um, so public records like parish records, um, school records, hostel records, um, the archive is supposed to have them. So there is some kind of mandatory relationship where uh, records get passed over. Um, but when an, arch when an archivist goes into a place, they survey and, and appraise the collection and they decide what they think is relevant um, to take about a particular collection, um, and that's decided by a person. Um, and so, as I was mentioning, sometimes archives are not catalogued, um, and if they're not catalogued, you can't search for them. And I said some descriptions can make it harder for you to find things. Um, and also, um, what's digitized. So, as I, you know, you have companies like Ancestry, Find My Past, that are often associated with family history, and they digitize parish records, and that has records that relate to um, burials, marriages, and deaths. Um, and the reason why they do that, because the number of the largely the people that actually access archives are white, middle class, uh, in their 50 to 60s, um, we refer to them as silver surfers. Um, and so they come, um, and th that's why those uh, archives are digitized. Um, you may get um, 
collection digitise about the black community, but that's only if the project has been externally funded, maybe from her Heritage Lottery funding or Arts Council funding, but otherwise you won't actually get your um, documents digitised. Um, and so that means it's difficult, really. Uh, but also some archivists may decide that a certain collection or conservators actually may decide a certain collection is too fragile um, or you can't access it because it's sensitive like for instance the British Library had records about human rights abuses that happened in Kenya the Mau Mau um, so there's an organization called Swiss Peace um, and they talk about archives that relate to human rights violations um, and having access to those um, and so yeah it, it is always asymmetric um, and you're navigating but I mean I often think maybe archives are a bit more democratic uh, compared to museums because in some ways you can access the collections you can physically hold the collections even though they may be hundreds of years old but um, like I said the majority of things that are collected don't relate to our history um, and so I don't know if that answers your question or <laughs> it's good enough okay I'll take that I mean, there are archives in the, if you look, if you look at the Glen Morgan uh, archives in Wales, but I know we have someone here, and Glen Jordan, um, who did a project actually with the Butte Town community, uh, the Somali Elders Project, where he um, photographed many of the old seamen and recorded their stories. So you can find a book actually that speaks about that community. Uh, it's called the Somali Elders Project uh, by Glen Jordan. Um, but it's, I mean, sometimes it's so fragmented and disconnected that we don't know what other people are doing. Um, and so that's sometimes difficult, actually. I have images that I've collected of my mum uh, back in the 70s and 80s, and she wasn't wearing a scarf. Uh, and she's not happy that I display it. And so that, that is an issue. People, cultures change, you know. Uh, so my people have become more conservative. So some of those images um, reflect a time that often they don't associate with anymore. Um, but it's important to actually listen to the person who owns the photograph. Um, I think, you know, it is difficult and you have to act with integrity. And if the person doesn't want to have their photograph out there, then we have to respect that, I think. Um, yes, we may see it as valuable. Uh, maybe we can record their story. Maybe we can use oral testimony to display their heritage, but um, it's important that actually, and also, you know, if you want the community to be on board, then you have to respect their views. Um, but I, yeah, I think, yeah, people have become more stricter um, and don't want to associate with that time. Um, but sometimes that happens when you do move to another country, um, you become more conservative. Yes, if you go in the National Archives, you will find, actually, I posted something in a Facebook group that I have, yeah, National Archives, you will find, actually, records of uh, Somalis who sailed in America, uh, and I think, and in Find My Past as well. So you can find documentation, those who actually received medals as well for fighting in the for, uh, Second World War. Um, you have cruise register lists that are in the Southampton archives um, that have photographs of seamen. Um, and I remember we went to, uh, we went, I went to Wales and they were talking about the stories of Somalis. Um, because they weren't considered as soldiers, so they didn't get they didn't get they didn't get the same benefits. Mm. Um, and you know, when they would die out in sea, the only way the mothers knew that their or the the wives knew that their husbands passed away because the money would stop. Um, but there are rec and yeah, and so it's and that history has not been told. Actually, the lack of recognition of Somalis. But you but the National Archives also have cruise register lists. Um, the one in Southampton is currently being digitised by Ancestry um, and that has an amazing archive. But if you go on Heritage of Somalis in Wales, you can actually um, see almost, I think, 1,700 images of Somali mm -hmm. seamen um, uh, and their details. Actually, they sort of did their own guerrilla style digitising and put it up there. Um, but now it's currently restricted because of a commercial relationship. Um, because as archives lose funding, they have to seek out these relationships, which then means that we can't actually access their records. So they'll be digitising for the next five years, and that, mean, well, that will mean restrictions in who can use that. Um, but yes, the National Archives and that website will definitely have things. Very cool. Wow. Cool. Great. Well, I think that... We can continue the conversation off mic. Um, I want to say thank you so much to all three of you. Are there, Osman?
be around for a bit to get to talk more. Abira, thanks for your continuing work, and I hope we get to work together. And can I just say, if you want to have a go at the museum yes. in a box, just over there. <laughs> totally. So Abira has the museum in a box over there. Adair Rasman has also written a children's book recently that contains a lot of the vanishing um, Rerbadie vocabulary, and we have that over here. Um, and Jenny, I, I wish yes, you really I, well in your I continuing work. My book, which is okay. over there. So yes. So I think, and illness. Yeah. I think what we're going to do is have a five-minute break. So enough.